on episode 270 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Derek Barras and discuss his book, Whole Motion, Training Your Brain and Body for Optimal Health. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 270. Have you decided you're ready to make a change? To reclaim your health and fitness? The 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. I'm your host, Alan Meisner. I'm an NSAM certified personal trainer with a specialization in corrective exercise and fitness nutrition. Let me be your coach as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. Hello, and thank you again for being a part of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast. I've got a great guest for you today. We had a really good conversation on training and form. But before I share that with you, I did want to go over a couple different things. Um, As you know, I did go through the uh, shoulder surgery a a couple weeks ago. Uh, It's now it's been a total of ten days as I record this, and the surgery went well, as I as I told you last week. Uh, No problems there, no complications. I've been back to the doctor. The wound is healing just beautifully. I I thought I might have a pretty bad scar the way it looked the first day, but it it seems to be uh, cinching up pretty good. So. uh, you know, making sure that I had the bone broth and whatnot, I think went a long way towards getting the materials my body needed to properly repair that and making sure that I had good blood flow by going to physical therapy. And that's what I wanted to spend a little bit more time talking about today. A lot of times folks will go through these injuries and don't really take into account how important it is to continue to move, even when it might be a little bit painful to do so, but to do so under the guide of a a professional. And so I did hire a very good professional. His name is Jeremy, and he's here in uh, Louisiana. Uh, And so I've been going to him three times a week. And I'll tell you, shoulder injury is not fun to rehab at all. A couple things that happened, uh, first couple days, obviously keeping my arm in the sling and not moving it at all before therapy, pretty much got myself into a point where the muscles in the back of my shoulder and on my traps had basically just locked up. Uh, They just froze as tight as rocks, and it was extremely painful for me, and I couldn't loosen it up. I tried uh, some uh, using a, a lacrosse ball to try to get some uh, some pressure on it to try to see if I could get it to give up. And my uh, attempts at SMR just did not work. As soon as I touched the spot, I had to I had to drop the ball. I couldn't I couldn't take it. So, the trainer put me through a uh, process uh, called dry needling. And if you haven't experienced dry needling, it's it's a very interesting therapy. They basically, it's uh, the best way I can describe it in audio form is that it's like acupuncture with electricity. And effectively, he taps in little needles into the muscle and then basically sends little pulses of electricity. That's similar to the same effect that you would get by putting pressure on it, but it's done in little pulses, which was a little painful at first. Obviously, getting a needle stuck into you is not no fun either, but that wasn't the worst part. Over two sessions, uh, we were able to get those muscles to properly relax, and the pain went away. He's been moving me through range of motion. Because I was still generally active in lifting where I could and keeping my arms moving during the period of time before the surgery, I'm pretty far along in my recovery of full range of motion. I would say right now I'm probably about 80% uh, full range of motion on, on most of the movements. There's a couple we aren't doing yet because we need to allow the muscle to heal. So we're going through passive range of motion, which means I'm not the one executing the change in the, in the, in where my arm is. Uh, I mean, it's either being done by him or maybe by a pulley or some other mechanism uh, with using my other arm, but all of my range of motion right now, all my movement on that arm is passive. And so that's allowing me to continue to build and rebuild, I guess, basically the range of motion in the shoulder joint area as the muscle heals. Um, The doctor said I had a pretty bad tear, so he had to do a little bit more extra folding and tying and stuff when he was in there, but it seems to be healing pretty well. It's not as painful as it was, Uh, obviously going for the therapy, uh, and that is quite painful for that period of time. It's a little sore after, but it settles out just like I've done a, a workout, and that's to be expected. So just thought I'd share that with you. If you do find yourself injured, and you know that it's something that's serious, do go get professional help. Make sure you have a good therapist. Ask people who know who the best therapist is for you based on who you are and your lifestyle. Jeremy works out great for me. He likes working with athletes. Um, he can work with anybody, but he really enjoys working with folks that, that care about you know getting themselves fit. And so the personality mesh is important, and it's working really well. 
Uh, Jeremy's getting me through therapy relatively quickly and relatively pain-free. So I'm enjoying that. And so I just thought I'd share that with you. It's uh, It's been an interesting journey so far. And as I have updates uh, each week, I'll, I'll let you know what's going on with that and uh, continue to share my journey so that if you go through something, you kind of have a general idea uh, of how it should play out. I was emailing with a client the other day, and he expressed some concerns that he didn't get enough variety in his diet. I couldn't help think back to my own past, and sometimes there were times when I was also very limited. But it's slightly different, as I do love trying new things, and he really doesn't. My limit related to my ability to afford good food. I mean, who's going to buy almond butter when it's five times more expensive than Jeff? We all know we can make better choices, and often those better choices come with a bigger price tag. But now there's Thrive Market. Thrive Market has cut out the middleman in getting high-quality, healthy food. This allows them to send you great products at up to 50% off retail. The savings are substantial, and it's all the incentive I need to get around to trying new things and stock up on my staples, all at a significantly discounted price. Another thing I really appreciate is the convenience. I can go on their website or using their mobile app, get what I need, get it shipped directly to me. They're a great company helping to make healthy food affordable for everybody. Beyond getting you a great discount when you join, you're sponsoring a membership for a low-income family. This is their Thrive Gives program. So not only do you get a great savings, you're helping other family get access to high-quality food. No more GIF on their table. Please go to thrivemarket.com forward slash four zero and check them out. As a special offer, you'll get 25% off your first order and free shipping. You can join under a 30-day free program, but I know you're going to love them and stick with them like I have. Go to thrivemarket.com forward slash 40. Give them a shot. It helps support 40 Plus Fitness Podcast and helps keep bringing you a good episode every week. So again, it's thrivemarket.com forward slash 40. Thank you. Our guest today has taught yoga, fitness, and studio cycling at Equinox Fitness since 2004, where he has been on the cutting edge of new workout programs. In 2014, he created Flow Play, an intersection of movement, music, and neuroscience. He is also a columnist for Big Think and 24 Life, the 24-hour fitness magazine. He and I share a lot of the same training philosophies, so I'm excited to bring you today's interview. Our guest is Derek Barras, and the book is Whole Motion, Training Your Brain and Body for Optimal Health. With no further ado, here's Derek. So Derek, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Thanks for having me. When I saw your book, Whole Motion, I'm thinking, okay, you know, I've done a few folks that have really talked about yoga and movement and patterns. And I like that because I really do think that this movement back towards kind of a functional fitness mindset, and the book is really a lot about body weight movement and whatnot. I thought, okay, this is a perfect book. I really want to feature this. But as I got into it, there's a lot more depth to this book than just let's move our bodies. You kind of put together a really good holistic program here. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I think it comes from having worked now at Equinox Fitness for 13 years. I've been teaching yoga for 14. But before that, I've been moving my whole life. I grew up playing sports, but into college. And then after I got into dance and martial arts, and I've just been fascinated with the different ways that we can move our bodies. And I've never been prejudiced against any of them. I'll try them all. There are things that I don't particularly like doing, but for the most part, movement is just not only my life, it is life. Like for example, when you have a thought, you fire motor neurons when you think about things. So there's an implied sense of movement even in thinking. And the one thing that I learned having come up through all the years is that exploring a range of ways to move is the healthiest option we can have. If you get sort of caught in only one sort of movement pattern or as often happens in our time, one sort of sedentary pattern where you don't move at all, that's when a lot of our health issues come up. And so I wanted to address that with this book. And you have this great quote. I'm sorry, it's it's, it's right at the beginning of the book. And, and like I said, this is when you had me. You're like, you know, the movie, the Jerry Maguire, you had me at hello. This was your hello of the book, I think. And it said, this book is about motion, disruption, and regeneration, predicated on an understanding that exercise is as important for your brain as it is for your body. Well, absolutely. And I guess I can say I came at yoga a little differently than a lot of people in that when I got to college, I started studying 
Eastern philosophies, and I ended up getting a degree in religion. And so I was studying the texts that yoga is based on before I ever got on a yoga mat. And there is a rich tradition of philosophy that's inherent in the yoga practice. We've adopted and help to evolve a movement discipline that really is not thousands of years old, that's about a century old. And I think that's wonderful. A lot of times in the yoga community, there'll be arguments over, well, that's not yoga. I can't stand those arguments because as long as people are moving and breathing, I think that's a good thing. But at the same time, having an understanding of why you do what you do is important. And I think it also enriches your appreciation for that movement if you have an idea of why it's going on. And that's what I tried to address with each of the movement disciplines in the book, as well as the second half, which is, yeah, you can throw your body around, but if you're not training your brain as intensely as your body, then you're setting up your body for all sorts of problems as you age as well. Well, the reality is they're, they're actually interconnected. And I want to get into that in just a second. It was funny. I was, I was having a conversation with my personal trainer today. And yeah, I'm, I'm the weird personal trainer that hires my own personal trainer because I want to push myself a little bit further. But it's funny because he'll, he'll bring up something like a book or a study or something, and we'll get to talking about it while we're doing our thing. So rather than talking about the basic exercise I'm doing, we're, we're off talking about something else. But he brought up you know, the fact that they were looking, they did a study of obese people and they found that obese people that actually had a high fitness level when they got an illness, it's not that they were getting less illnesses, but when they got an illness, their prognosis was so much better. And the reality was that the exercise was preparing their body to be better suited to deal with issues. So there's just kind of this interconnectedness of if you're doing movement, even if you know, you're know you not in the healthiest of situations, your body is, is so much better prepared to deal with, with situations. And so that's kind of one side of it, which I'd like for you to go ahead and comment on. Well, you know, there's a study that just recently came out that says the way that we measure body mass index is not really applicable to most people. It's not really helpful. And even when you read studies about how 67% of Americans are overweight, that's tremendous. And I, granted, I've lived in two very active cities, New York City and now in Los Angeles, and especially on the west side of Los Angeles, it's fitness is a culture here. And I appreciate that. And I know in other regions, food deserts and people don't have the movement opportunities. That's important to recognize. So I don't want to gloss past that. But the way that we measure fitness is so visual because we're very much visual learners. And so we sort of put on this idea of what fitness is by what we see on magazine covers. And that's really disheartening and dangerous because it sets up people to have all sorts of exercise disorders and eating disorders from that. A healthy body is one that moves well and is is in homeostasis as much as possible in terms of their functioning. And if you can carry your own weight and do what you need to do to get through the day, that's a healthy body. It's the unhealthy movement patterns as well as the unhealthy attentional patterns that we have, which is really what the brain section is about, not paying attention to your environment, that are dangerous. I have such a wide range of bodies in my classes and that is really important that people are able to do what they can do rather than thinking about what they can't do. And the reality is when we do what we can do, eventually we're going to be able to do what we want to do if we keep working at it. And that's core here. Now, you hit on something really early in this book, and I was like, okay, this is worth the price of admission for the book entirely is. And it was a concept that I really had not wrapped my mind around entirely until you kind of wrapped it all in a nice little package and put a bow on it for me was... In thinking in terms of form, and I tell my clients, okay, form is everything. Form tells you that you're not going to hurt yourself because you're lifting and you're doing the things the way they're intended for your body to do them. So your body is going to naturally be able to do this without harming itself. But you kind of wrapped in this whole deal of muscle memory. And so from, I think most people will recognize that muscle memory is when you do something over and over and over again a certain way, your body remembers how to do it that way. So like we learned how to ride a bike as a kid and most of us know we could probably walk out there today and get on a bicycle, even if we haven't ridden a bicycle in years and generally know how to do it because of general muscle memory. When you pair those two things together, you end up with what can be actually quite brilliant in that we learned good form and we're using muscle memory to, to remember that form or it can actually be quite devastating 
if we're teaching our body bad form. Absolutely. And everything is our concept of how we perceive reality, whether it's the way that we think or in the way that we move. I can take an hour to talk about this next book, and I'm just going to gloss over because I'm reading it right now. It's called How Emotions Are Made. And the author, uh, Lisa Barrett, she's talking about how we have this idea that emotions are across the board, they're universal. And she's just building this argument that our perception of reality is different culturally and environmentally, so that our emotional responses are different across the board. But why that's important in right now, what we're talking about, is that the way that we move and the way that we think about things is colored by our history. And we will always take the path of least resistance, right? That's a cognitive trait that we have because we, don't, we wanna conserve energy. So if we have, for example, 30 things to choose from or two things to choose from, we'll much rather have two because we could just say, okay, let me just take this. This happens all the time. And it happens in our movement patterns. It happens in our driving patterns so that if we're going somewhere, taking the same way, we'll rather sit in traffic because we're comfortable with that way rather than trying out new directions. So you're creating these conditions when you're constantly moving and thinking in the same way that it's very stagnant and you no longer are able to think creatively about how you're moving, which directly ties into how well you remember, which is later part in the book. But your memory system suffers because you're not constantly changing up how you move around in your environment. And again, you have a memory. This is the basis of a trauma. You have a memory and you get stuck in that memory over and over again. Whereas if you're constantly changing it up, both mentally, emotionally, and physically, you're much better suited to navigate a lot of different environments for whatever is called for. And that historically, evolutionarily, that's what we needed. We always needed to be on guard in our environment for invaders or for animals, things that could, you know, take us out very quickly. We no longer have those concerns. So I think we've gotten a little lazy with that ability. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just, like I said, it's kind of funny as today, like I said, I was doing exercise and my trainer was like, well, I'm thinking I'm going to lower the weight because you're, you're kipping a little bit too much. And I'm like, okay, I was kipping because that was the comfortable way <laughs> to move the weight. And looking back at it, after he said it, I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what I was doing and wasn't thinking about it the way that I needed to think about it. And I was teaching myself a bad movement pattern. Whereas then from that point forward, I was able to, you know, not, well, he did lower the weight because he just said he was going to lower the weight. But from that point forward, I was very cognizant of, okay, I'm going to be very careful not to do that because I know that's a bad movement pattern. And I don't, you know, having again read your book, I don't want that to be the muscle memory that my body's thinking in terms of this is how I move the weight. I want to be very methodical about how I'm doing this with my form and with the movement and actually teach my body this is the way I do this exercise. It's hard. I teach a format called Viper and I teach a Viper kettlebell class. And it's so it's in the main studio, not just the yoga classes. And people in the main studio, a lot of them tend, they just want to go hard. They want to feel like they got worked out really hard. They want to sweat. They want their heart rate to go up. They have their heart rate monitor. They want to hit a certain goal. And what suffers in that mindset is form. And the repetitive stress injuries that happen in there, or if you want to talk about chaturangas in yoga, which is constantly a disaster. When people don't take the time to learn their form, they're just setting their their bodies up for all sorts of injuries. And one thing I like to do in both of my formats is do the same sort of movements, but coming from different angles and different directions so that they don't get comfortable if they're always doing a burpee in the same way, if they're always doing a snatch in the same way. We're constantly toying with things within the realm of what is good for their bodies to get them out of the mindset that, oh, it always has to be this way and trying to keep them fresh in that sense. And of course, I mean, the one thing you want to make sure of with doing things wrong is just constantly being on people. It's a little different. It's hard when you have 30 or 40 people in the room as compared to one-on-one. -on -one. And it's one of the things I don't have because I'm not a trainer that I do appreciate trainers for is that they get that real detailed information that it's hard to conduct in a group class. Yeah. And, and that's part of it. As I, I knew with this lifting program, what I wanted to do was going to be very heavy, very intense. And, you know, being a little older, did not want to injure myself too much. So 
I have been very meticulous and made sure he's holding me accountable to my form. And I know it nine times out of 10 when he says something, I'm like, yeah, I know. And, <laughs> you know, uh, and I fix it. He's like, that was perfect. You know, you did great. I'm like, yeah, I know, but I should have done that the first set. But it is what it is. And I just, again, I really appreciate how you married the muscle memory in the form in a way that I could, I could really wrap my head around and, uh, and that I can use. Now, you have a regeneration program that I think is pretty good from the perspective of it, it puts together three basic principles of exercise that a lot of people really don't incorporate in their day-to-day. So they think about exercise as getting on a machine or lifting weights or running or doing this. But I would call these exercises because I think they really are, if not physical, at least mental exercises that are going to regenerate your body. Do you mind going through the three pieces of your regeneration program? Sure. The program starts with Feldenkrais. And I get a bit into the history of him because he was just such a fascinating historical character in terms of movement and his understanding. His books are phenomenal. But for the purposes of right now, if you've never taken a Feldenkrais, one of the basis of his program is being able to get up and down without pain. So getting off the floor, getting out of a chair, just being able to sit and stand. And that is a real concern of people as they age, obviously. So the easier you can get about your daily living activities without pain, that's really the goal of it. He came up with the program because he had a torn meniscus from a soccer injury. And the doctors, this was in the 30s, And the doctors were basically saying, yeah, there's a 50% chance we can help you. And he was like, that's not good enough for me. And so what happened was he lied down. And after a series of events happened, he lied down and he closed his eyes and he focused on these very small articulations of his injured knee. And he spent a half an hour doing that. What he realized is when he primed his brain to go to that area to do these small movements, he could accomplish the same amount of work in his other knee in two minutes as what he took him a half an hour to get into. And so his whole program came from that. And it's wonderful. There's so many different movements of just rolling around and getting up and back down that are very helpful. And again, you're right. We don't think of as fitness or exercise, but really is the most fundamental movements that we need. And then after the strength training and high intensity portion, we go back to yoga and meditation. And if you've never meditated, that's probably the hardest exercise that is possible. And because we don't physically move, People who haven't tried it or don't have much experience with it or write it off as doing nothing or I don't want to just sit there, I want to do something. And yet emotional and mental regulation and the ability to focus for a sustained period of time, that translates into everything that you do. That can help you in every sort of situation and environment, but you need to take the time to be able to do that. And there's so many positive benefits that have come about of meditation, which isn't surprising. But just being able to still your thoughts, not not think, but able to focus on something for a period of time, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever your practice is, is really beneficial. And it will help in all of your other exercise formats tremendously because like Feldenkrais, being able to drop into the other side more quickly, the same thing translates in terms of your exercises so that when you need to get going, your ability to focus is that much sharper. Yeah, I know when I was trying to get into yoga and initially, and I was like, okay, I'm really struggling to sit in a any given pose for a period of time. It just seemed like, okay, they put us in a pose And in that static, isometric hold, it was painful. And what I found was the more that I kind of got into meditation as kind of a byproduct of all of that, then I found that my ability to concentrate and breathe actually improved my ability to hold my static strength, which is counterintuitive. It's like, well, you know, just the ability to breathe and think shouldn't actually make you better at isometric strength, but it does. Yes. One thing that I teach in my classes, especially for people who are new to it, is not to go for 100% of your stretch in your first breath. Find your first point of conflict. As soon as you start to feel the stretch, just stop there. Stop and let your body acclimate. Because if you push into your deepest stretch when you're trying to hold something for five breaths, 10 breaths, whatever it happens to be, I happen to teach a more flowing style of yoga. I'm not super huge on those sustained isometric stretches, except at the end of a class when it's more of a cool down. But those styles are wonderful as well. That's the 
more the Hatha tradition and, and its offshoots from there. But just find that first point where you feel it and just become comfortable there. And then once, when you no longer have the sensation, then move a little deeper. But I think because, you know, sometimes people will see people in the front row who are super flexible and they're in this deep pose, they try to accomplish that. And that's when you're going to get into real danger because you're just going to be in this position that you shouldn't be in and you're going to hate it for the entire time that you're there. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but no, that's not a deep pose for me initially because, I, you know, having come from a athletic but football background and then, you know, trying bodybuilding and whatnot, I didn't build the best movement patterns to begin with as a younger person. So, and I'm paying for that now. I do realize that, but I do work on mobility. I do work on uh, trying to be a little bit more of a movement pattern person than I had been before, but it's it's a healing thing for me versus just a natural moving the way my body should be moving. So I do really appreciate that a lot more than I than I do I did before, which uh, I wish I'd known this or appreciated this much earlier in my life because then I would not be dealing with a lot of the injuries that I've dealt with coming to this point now. Another aspect you kind of get into, which again, I'm, I'm a big fan of, is Tabatas. And you talk about Tabatas in your book. Can you kind of get into the Tabata, how you approach Tabatas and how you would like to use them? Well, I, I use those for the book because when I was envisioning the book, I really wanted to make a program that people could use with just their body. And besides the section in regeneration, and I didn't bring this up because it's it was wrapped up in the very beginning, but foam rolling and, and specifically yoga tune-up balls. So fascia rolling is also part of the book. But besides that tool, everything else is just with your body. And that was important. And I am not a runner. I enjoyed running. I've torn my labrum twice and my meniscus once training for half marathons. So I've been stubborn about wanting to run and every time. So I've no longer do that cardio. I do studio cycling for my sustained cardio. But for a book, I was like, I'm not going to write, even though I talk about running, I'm like, I'm not going to write a program about running. But Tabata's are just such a phenomenal way of really getting your metabolism going, getting your heart rate up, and getting that cardiovascular exercise that you need in a very short burst, which are his program is 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off for four minutes. So you do eight reps. And then you can do one, you can do a series. I have three different exercises in the book. But it really is a nice way to, again, get your heart rate up and just get some movement in and get everything in your body working. The only problem I've come across when I've taken Tabata classes is, again, because it's such a fast burst, is that you really got to get the form down first. So I do teach some Tabatas in my warm-ups, but we always do a slow round first so that I can see everyone. So for example, if I see someone jumping back to do a burpee and their shoulders are coming behind their wrists, I'll make them step back. I'm like, just step back and forward. You're still going to get the work and you're going to save your shoulders that way. So focus on that. But once you get the form of the movement down, that quick burst is really, really invigorating and healthy. I do a triple Tabata too with a lot of my clients. And I, I particularly like that when I'm in a situation where I get to do a group class. Because the cool thing about a group class is because we're all on the same clock, we don't all necessarily have to be moving at the same speed, but we're all at the same point. So it's kind of a cool way of saying, you work as hard as you need to work to meet your goal. So if you're pushing yourself through this hard work session, taking your rest, and then you're getting all the benefit, even if you're not necessarily moving as fast, or maybe you're moving three times as fast as anyone else, but it's your own workout at your own pace, and we're all going through this together. But I do like kind of a triple setting, the Tabatas, because I think it gives you a huge opportunity to really kind of, and like you've done it as well in yours, is to put together a kind of a full body, let's cover the bases here and get you as fit as we can get you in a short period of time. And it really is very efficient and uh, very effective. And I want to add what you just said. I wish everyone could adopt that mentality. It's it's one of my my biggest things as a as a professional in this industry is that the understanding that if you go into a room of people and someone's judging you, that's their stuff coming up. You know, it's not your stuff. And that's always what I've come because I've, I also teach online classes and I have a lot of people email me about that. And they're like, we don't have the confidence to go into a room and we like the online. And I'm like, great, that's it's great that it serves you. But the community aspect that you brought up is such a big part of why I've stayed in this industry. I mean, 
most of my day, I'm also a journalist and I work in music, but I'm mostly behind the scenes on these things. And so my social community is all at the gym. And that's one of the, another great benefit just emotionally of being in an environment that supports you like that. Yeah. Well, Jim Rohn wrote, you're the product of the five people you spend the most time with. And so if you're spending time in the gym with some folks, they're probably among those five. And so at that point, realize that uh, fitness has now become an important aspect of your life because those are the people you're spending your time with versus, you know, uh, hanging out at bars or, or doing other things that aren't as healthy. And so, you know, yes, being a part of a community and in many cases, uh, gyms, uh, particularly group classes can, in fact, be those group situations where you're really kind of getting that connection and making connections with people who are also kind of like minded working on their health and fitness, even if they're a different port part of their journey you're still there together. And I think that's, uh, there's a whole lot of value to that. Absolutely. Just from a health perspective, I mean, loneliness, you know, the worst thing you could do to a human is put them in solitary confinement that for everything in their body. It's the worst thing you could do. So being around people is that's kind of the peak of health in so many ways. And longevity, because, uh, you know, as they mentioned in the book, Blue Zones, uh, you know, that was one of the core elements of the people that live the longest is they just, they have really cool social lives. And, uh, you know, it's a big part of having longevity and having a great life. And, you know, it's not about living longer. It's about living better. And so, yeah, having good social interactions and, and you won't find better friends than you will at the gym. Absolutely. So now you bring up a topic in the book called mismatch disease. Do you mind going into mismatch disease? Yes, that's a topic. I don't know if Daniel Lieberman, who is a Harvard paleo anthropologist, came up with that term. I don't know if he came up with that term, but he definitely explores it deeply in his book, The Story of the Human Body. And I'm sort of, as I was studying religion in college, I also got really into anthropology. So I love knowing origins and I like knowing how we got to where we are. And from a movement perspective, we are so far from what our ancestors <laughs> did. What do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> it's like, didn't they walk around with their elbows by their side with their thumbs clicking on some little piece of bark, you know, uh, <laughs> their heads slumped over walking, not looking where they're walking. <laughs> I live, as I said, in Los Angeles. And tonight on Tuesday and Thursday nights, after I get off with you, actually, I'll be heading over to Hollywood, which is the only time I have to commute really all week where I get in traffic. And the 10 is a major thoroughfare. And it just amazes me. It's a five lane highway on each side. And people are just driving with their knees, both hands on the phone. And I'm like, this is insane. And it's also a perfect example of a mismatch. That's what a mismatch is. You're not properly moving around your environment. And how the world is constructed and how you're moving about it are at odds. And what suffers is you. I mean, the environment is the environment, but what suffer, I mean, it's suffering, but mostly for our benefit. And how we're moving about is nothing like the sitting at 90 degree angles, for example. One thing I do, you know, I change my flows every week and I've done that my entire career because I just, I want people to constantly be stimulated in trying new things and not get used to one specific form of movement who practice with me. But one thing I always do is squatting. Because squatting is one of the primary movements, right? Squatting, jumping, pushing, pulling. But we do a lot of jumping. Just running is more of a controlled form of jumping. That's what Christopher McDougall wrote, right, in Born to Run, which I thought was brilliant. But we don't squat. And everything, so we know the importance of food and we know how important it is to move the food out of our body properly. And if we were doing that, we'd be squatting. We wouldn't be on a toilet. So that's a mismatch, right? Sitting in a way that doesn't honor how our intestines are actually constructed to let everything through. You're not a sponsor of Squatty Potty, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I have one. I have one. And my, when, my wife, when she first saw it, when we started dating, she was just like, I, what is this? What is this hippie? You know, whatever. And she's become a huge fan. I mean, and everyone is who actually tries it because it's like, oh, this doesn't, I'm not straining. Yeah, I'm a huge fan. I'm not an ambassador though. <laughs>
But sugar is a mismatch disease. That's something I write about in the book. On, this is the, a chapter on nutrition, like the amount of sugar and carbohydrates that we eat. It's a mismatch to what our body was designed to take in and sustain off of. So I think that's a really, I'm always looking at those things, looking for them in, in terms of how we're navigating around our space. And that also includes social spaces and what you said about, you know, when you're looking down at that piece of bark and your fingers are on it, you're not paying attention to bumping into people and getting back to the gym, I see both men and women this constantly where they do a set and then they're texting and then they do a set and they're te- or they're on cardio texting. And I'm like, you realize you're not even getting close to your optimal workout because what's going on in your head needs to be focused on your form. And if you're talking to someone in your head at that time, that your form is suffering, which is going to lead to a lot of problems. And I don't know how to undo that. I'm praying for autonomous cars to save our lives because uh, I think there'll be a lot fewer accidents (laughs) when the cars are driving and people can just go ahead and text and not worry about it. But it's just, yeah, it's really hard because you just see it happening every day, the structural change of people as they, they go through this process of okay, I'm going to sit all day or I'm going to text all day and elbows by the side, thumbs up, phone in hand and head down. And long term, that's not going to work out. And I think autonomous driving is actually worse of an idea for that reason. I think it's better in terms of the 420,000 people every year who are either injured or killed because of distracted driving. But it's worse in what you're saying. It's worse because people are then going to feel more comfortable. They're going to do it even more often. And again, think of what meditation, a big part of meditation is, is being focused and present in the moment. And the more time you're spending on a device, you're being removed from the moment in your environment around you, which is only, I really predict in the coming generations, a serious uptick in diseases of dementia and Alzheimer's because our attention span is already so short that that's only going to keep translating as we age. And I'm really, I'm really worried. I mean, at this point with, I'm 42 and I think a lot of my peers are going to suffer from that, but the generation below me and the next, I think it's going to be a real problem. if Something isn't done about that. I'm just a little bit older than you, but my wife gets so frustrated with me because I'll just set my phone down somewhere and just wander off and you know, <laughs> do my thing. And she's like, it's like, you never answer your text. So I'm like, oh, you texted me? Okay, well, let me go find my phone and I'll, I'll figure out what you told me. Like right now, I, oh yeah, it's in my back pocket, actually. I, <laughs> I almost didn't know where my phone was because I haven't looked at it in an hour or so. And, and it's because I've had such a great conversation with you. And I think that's one of the kind of the missing elements as we kind of look at this social connection and being well And the whole thing is really kind of bringing your mind and your body to the present. And yoga, meditation, movement, they're all actually a big part of that. When you're doing those things well, you're in the present. Absolutely. And hopefully enjoying it. That's something my one of my closest friends and my wife as well, they're not really gym people because they don't like the idea of being fit because they don't enjoy the repetitive movements, but they're both healthy because they like doing like my friend is a circus juggler, right? So he does stuff like that to keep it. And so the enjoyment of it and that also enjoyment of life is greatly enhanced by the ability to pay attention to what you're doing as well. And so all of those things are suffering. And then you've created a circumstance if you're constantly distracted where you're doing something not optimally And you're constantly thinking about something else, so you're not going to enjoy the moment. So yes, it's all tied back to presence and being able to pay attention to whatever you're doing at every moment. So the book is called Whole Motion, Training Your Brain and Body for Optimal Health. And so Derek, this is a great book, a lot of great information in here and the exercises and whatnot. We didn't even get into even a fraction of what's in here. So I really appreciated the opportunity to read the book had awesome time having this conversation with you. If someone wanted to get in touch with you, learn more about the book, learn more about what you do, where would you like for me to send them? I am uh, DerekBarris.com. I am very active on social media, even though I <laughs> try to I keep it to when I need to be on it, but I am very active and it's how I reach not out. Not while to you're it. driving to Hollywood. <laughs> no, definitely not when I'm driving. But when I'm home writing, I am on it. And DerekBarris.com has all of the links to everything that you might be on. Well, this is episode 270. So you can go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 270 
and find those links to get in touch with Derek and learn more about the book, Whole Motion. So again, Derek, thank you so much for being on 40 Plus Fitness. Thank you. I had a great talk as well. I appreciate it. If you enjoyed this episode, would you please share it with friends and family through Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Thank you. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Kelly Noonan and Adam Schromer and discuss their documentary, Heal. Until then, have a happy and healthy day.